Happy, happy New Year, Freedom Center! First Sunday in a new year. Anything that you've ever done wrong is behind you. It's a new year. Has anybody got any New Year's resolutions? Well, I'm going to start going to the gym and I'm going to lose how much. Well, okay, I'm not going to talk about that one. I'm going to tell you my New Year's resolution. To spend more time in his presence. To go deeper with the Lord this year than ever before. We start a fun thing today. There may be times in the next 21 days that you think it's not fun. But we start 21 days of praise, prayer, and fasting. And that is going to help me accomplish my goal this year. To spend more time in his presence. Maybe I won't spend so much time at the buffet. Maybe I won't spend so much time playing video games. I know that don't hit home with anybody. All the youth aren't here this morning. We want to spend more time in his presence. Stand to your feet as we God bless America this morning. God bless America.
Keep believing. 
shake three hands this morning and tell them happy new year in the name of Jesus All right. Yeah. Happy New Year, everybody. Man. And uh, we just sang going to another level, right? All right. I got just the way to go to another level. One of the ways. Join a home fellowship group. All right. Yeah. Yeah, that wasn't too many. That <laughs> okay. We really want to uh, push and uh, uh, really emphasize the home fellowship groups this year. Uh, as you know, that's one of the, the main lifebloods of this church. So, I, you know, I was going to say pray and ask the Lord, but uh, trust me, he wants you in a home group because that's where you really connect with fellow Christians you know, pray and fellowship together. So really would like each member to be a part of a home group. And uh, as a part of that, uh, Greg and Linda, of course, have started uh, Families on the Go. And so they're gonna meet again this coming Wednesday. My home group is gonna meet this Wednesday. So uh, we're getting back in the, the swing of things, amen? All right. We've got a precious lady that sits on the front row, Elizabeth Bearden, that's 102 years old today. Elizabeth Bearden. Yeah. Hallelujah.
Wow. If you're asking, well, how come they didn't do that for my birthday? When you get 102, we will, all right? Mm. Amen. That's it. <laughs> Maybe even 101, okay. <laughs> all right, we're having the uh, youth today, led by Aaron Holden, four to seven. They're getting cranked back up uh, also. Also, Growing Kids God's Way. This is the uh, program that uh, Brian and Cassandra Teal are starting here at the body. And that's going to be first meeting Sunday in a couple weeks. When is it? There it is, February 10th. Okay, Growing Kids God's Way. And we're going to have the girls' night out coming up. Amen? Yeah. That's going to be Tuesday, January 29th, 6 o'clock for the food and seven o'clock for Miss Linda doing the teaching. And uh, kind of as a part of that, okay. Elizabeth Pitcher is uh, starting a ladies fitness class. Uh, get the connection, yeah, all right. That's gonna be uh, starting January 15th here at seven o'clock, right? So ladies, not that anybody needs it, but uh, maybe, <laughs> Maybe just a little toning, okay? <laughs> okay, a little toning going on. <laughs> That's January 15th at 7. Also, if you are a first or second time visitor, would you please stand and uh, let us recognize you? First or second time visitor? Come on, there's got to be somebody, huh? Ah, there we go. There we go. Thank you, ma'am. All right. Linda. Good morning, everyone. Um, just a few things. This month, we're beginning a new mentor mentoring program at our church called Freedom Friends. And we're so excited about this program. And what we want this program to look like is um, there may be someone, and this is going to span all age groups, there may be someone who is at a point in their life where they need some guidance. They need um, someone to follow, um, an example of what it's supposed to look like. Um, for instance, there might be a teenage boy who needs to know what it's supposed to look like to be a man, and he needs that guidance in their, their life, his life. There may be someone who's gone into retirement years, and they're just, they feel like they're floundering, and they just need some guidance, some wisdom, some encouragement. And so it might be a young mom also that feels like, I don't know how to do this. I need some guidance. If you're in that season in your life where you really feel like you need some guidance, some wisdom, someone who's already gone that path, um, we have some sign-up sheets at the back today. And for the next two weeks, we're going to be asking people who would like to be a mentee, that means they would like to have a mentor in their life, to sign up at the back. And it's not going to be an indefinite program. It's going to be um, until, um, it's going to start at the end of this month until the end of May. And um, so if you are interested in having a mentor in your life, please sign up at the back, and then we will um, contact you and give you more information. Also, there were um, several of you that received a letter about being a mentor. If um, we've asked you to pray about that, whether the Lord has given you a yay or a nay, we would ask you if you would contact the church and let us know specifically so that we can give you the information and the dates that are coming up. So please make sure that you let us know either yes or no if you want to participate. Also, as we said, we're starting Growing Kids God's Way, and we're just so appreciative of Brian and um, Cassandra Till who have stepped up to the plate. And I want them to come up... Um, to the front for a second and introduce them to you and they're going to share their heart with you about this new ministry in our church. This is Brian and Cassandra. Good morning. Hey, so we are, uh, um, we're excited about this. A lot of you may have heard about the, uh, the Ezos. They did the Baby Wise programs and the Growing Kids God's Way. This is just an extension of that. It's uh, Parenting the Middle Years. And it talks about what is called the, the tweens. It's the 8 to 12-year-old time frame. When, when our children are moving from, uh, 
from this dependence on us, on their parents, into, into an independent stage and, and complete independence as they move out of the teenage years and, and we, we release them into the world. And so this time, as Dr. Ezzo talks about, is it's very transitional. And that they're going through changes biologically, they're dealing with moral issues, social issues. We want this to be a time <coughs> to, uh, to educate us. It's something that we need to understand the questions that are coming. We need to know what's coming at us. We need to know how to respond to those questions because it's, it's going to provide us a, a road map, if you will. You know, there has to be a plan. Parenting needs to be very uh, intentional, as Pastor Greg's talked about. It needs to be something that we, we know where we're going and we know where we want our kids to be as we send them out into the world. So we're excited about this. We think it's, um, it, it's a wonderful study. It's a wonderful program. You, you want to say something? I can speak to the moms. I know for me it's been educational to read about the tweens. Just to, I need to change my parenting style. I spent so much energy just shielding my children from what they hear, what they see, what they watch. And I've been, I've been educated that this tween years is really when you want, when you want to talk to them about the, the big things like dating and marriage and being pure. And now is the time as I sit and watch a movie with my daughter to start dreaming with her about marriage instead of just always shielding her to what dating is, to start dreaming with her. What's gonna, what is it going to look like? What is going to be our plans for dating in our family? Because if we wait until they're 14, 15, 16, we're not going to be cool to them anymore. <laughs> but right now, they'll still listen to us. So that's been a big uh, mind shift for me as we enter into the tween years, is to no longer just completely be shielding them, but talking to them and having these conversations with them. So that's been... Yeah, th that's good. It's a, it's a time when, when they are probably uh, expanding a little bit, and they're going to start questioning, and that doesn't have to be a bad thing. We just want to know how to respond to those questions, how to teach them and guide them. And the idea is that we can deal with this transitional phase now and, and that we, we don't have as many, let's say, big challenges later on as teenagers. So we're excited. We appreciate the opportunity. There is going to be child care through 12 years old. Uh, going to be Sunday afternoon, Sunday evenings at 5, 5 o'clock, and we're starting February the 10th. So, appreciate it. Oh, also, real quick, we, we want everybody to come, but I don't know the right term, an outreach. We, would, we want, tell your friends, tell, tell other people. This, this is intended to be a ministry for the whole community, okay? So, bring them in, okay? Child care, free child care, and it's, it's going to be a great time of fellowship as well. So, thanks. Awesome. Make sure you sign up at the back so that we'll know who needs child care and who needs books to be ordered because we're going to order books for that. Elizabeth Pitcher, would you come up for a second? Elizabeth is going to be starting our Healthy and Fit class, and she's going to share her heart. Okay, just as Brian said, you know, our bodies are the temple of God, so we have to be intentional of taking care of the body. But at the same time, we don't just take care of the body and forget about the spirit. So there's more than one thing to deal with. So Tuesday the 15th, a group of ladies, I hope I'm not standing there by myself. Please don't let me just be standing there going over the routine like I've done at home because I need some bodies. But we'll work together. The class is going to grow as people come in. So I don't want you to be inhibited thinking, oh my gosh, I couldn't possibly do this class. This class is going to be for a beginner, for an intermediate, or an advanced. You can make it as intense as you want. You can come lead it if you get more intense than me, and I'll get in and let you take care of it. So, but I don't want anyone to be inhibited by it. The, the Bible tells us in Psalms 139, 14, that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. I personally want to be fearfully fit and wonderfully wise, which means physical and spiritual. So I would love to have you join us. All you need to do, if you're wondering about what to wear, make sure you have tennis shoes on, some comfortable clothes. We're at church. We want to be modest. So please don't put me in the position of having to say, oh, no, because I have been asked that we have a modest class. And I am going to follow that under the pastorship of the church. Um, the music, if you never listen to praise music during the week, this is one time that you will have 50 minutes to an hour of nothing but praise music. And it's upbeat, fast tempo, and a couple of slow songs to cool down to. But there's something about, I've done a lot of exercise classes in gyms. And sometimes the things they say just don't relate to me. Because they're saying, you know, your husband's chewed you out. This is his face. You're punching him. And I'm thinking, no, that's Satan, and I'm punching him. 
So that's what you're going to hear in this class. You know, as the devil beat you up today, let's beat him up. So if you have any questions about anything, the church will have my number if you need to call. Um, there's a sign-up sheet in the back. If you have a mat, bring it just for, excuse me, for ab work. Um, so your, your backbone doesn't hit the floor and stuff. Uh, a water bottle's good and a great attitude. That is over 50% of the battle. It's just an attitude to have fun with a group of ladies. And I see this as turning into something where it's also just a time of getting to know your sisters in Christ at your church that you might not get to normally. So it's only going to be an hour class. It's in the administration. In the administration, um, I will be here Tuesday, January 15th. And I'm going to tell you it's by the grace of God because I had neck surgery two months ago. God is so good. Two months ago, this coming Wednesday. And I'm here to tell you by the grace of God, I can do every single thing that I did before I started because of people out of here that prayed. So I am fearfully fit because of God's grace and because of God's strength. And I want us all to be fit and wise. God bless you. Every day, every day. 
with you, Lord.
Standing on the promises of Christ our King Through eternal ages let His praises Glory in the highest I will shout and sing the stand Sometimes there's nothing else to stand on but his promises and knowing that he will see us through. Knowing that he has our best interest at heart. Oh, Lord. 
voices and sing with me. I bring an offering of worship to my King. No one on earth deserves the praises that I sing. Jesus alone. Jesus, may you receive the honor that you're due. Thanks and gratitude to you, my King. Father, we worship you right now. Lord, as we enter a time of taking an offering, a season right now of first fruits. That's what we're wanting to lay before you as a fast, Lord God, as a church body, an offering, Lord God, that our very being would be an offering to you, Lord God. Lord, that you would have our heart, you would have our mind, you would have our body, and Lord, in everything that comes with that. Father, we do. We, we lay down an offering to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus, our King. Jesus, the high priest. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Father, we thank you for everything that you have brought us through this year. Lord, every blessing, everything that you've taught us. Lord, everything. Your hand has been on our lives. And Father, now we, we step into a threshold of something new. This is what we're singing about today, a new level, new things, new opportunities, Father. And we begin it, Father, by just laying it all down as an offering to you. Prayer, praise, and fasting, Lord, just seeking your face. You are mighty. You are awesome. You are glorious. You are all-powerful. We give you all the praise and all the glory because you are worthy of it. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want you to be seated. Thank you, Pastor. <clears throat> Good morning, Freedom Center. It's, uh, it's time to stand on what we just sung about. We sung about uh, standing on the promises of God. And in the area of finances, God gives us a wonderful opportunity to trust Him in His promises. Amen. When you pay your tithes and make offerings, he promises to open up the windows of heaven so that they will overflow upon you and he will rebuke the devourer. Any attacks from the enemy can be staved off through your tithes and offerings. I also want to thank you for the eldership. In December, you all responded with the strongest month we've seen in several years. And I want to thank you all for that. And I know you're going to be blessed for it. Amen. And as we go into 2013, let's remember those promises. Speak those promises to God. When you pay your tithes and offerings, speak to God that the windows of heaven will flow upon you and you will rebuke the attacks of the enemy. Amen. Uh, for those of you giving cash offering, the ushers have envelopes. If you need an envelope, uh, please raise your hand so we can make record of your giving. Uh, let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for this opportunity to, to sow into your kingdom, to sow into to all the programs and events that you've planned for this coming year in 2013, Lord. We just pray that fruit is produced that glorifies you, Lord, and we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
quickly. Kept hearing this through the songs this morning. From the rising of the sun To the going down of the same The name of the Lord Shall be praised going down of the same the name of the Lord shall be praised praise you the Lord praise the rock. 
ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. The name of the Lord shall be praised. It says all the earth will rejoice. You know, rejoice literally means to spin around. And that's why the earth is always rejoicing. Because <laughs> the earth literally is always spinning around. Rejoicing. Just as a child dances, they naturally spin with joy. And that's what you do when you rejoice. The Lord is worthy of praise. That's something you don't stop doing. I know you saw this morning when you walked through the door, you got a book. Apologize for that. Just trying to give you some information. I think, I didn't confirm, but I believe part of that on your, uh, I moved the scriptures up to the top left hand corner and uh, put a couple of announcements of what's coming. On the bottom, you'll see that uh, there was, uh, I've got a, a few people that write for me and send me some information on certain topics. Uh, Barbara Long's one of them, Dr. Carnahan, Ray Harwell, uh, um, who else is, uh, uh, Barbara Long, uh, uh, Brian Teal has done it, and uh, uh, Paula, Paula Jones. And I believe this came out of uh, Dr. Carnahan's uh, writing that he sent me on fasting. Just wanted to include that, has some helpful tips there, a website that you can go to in case you're wanting to do a Daniel fast for the 21 days. Gives you some, some do's and some don'ts in there. Just some food for thought. I don't even have before me what you have completely. I also put in there um, kind of a 21-day focus of thought for each day and scriptures that you can look up regarding those thoughts. So that's uh, no, okay. I believe that's all in there. And then I actually uh, kind of condensed my notes, today's notes in there, so you actually have that. So, hey. <laughs> I was uh, on a roll. Um, last week, before I, actually before I start, a couple of things. There was one announcement I needed to reiterate. I forgot what it was. What was it? Healing service. Healing service is Thursday, okay? We are having healing service this week. And uh, that's been an awesome thing. And I just want to kind of connect you to that. You know, we are streaming live. I've had a lot of feedback on that. It's been awesome. But we're... We're streaming everything we do. So when we have healing service, we're streaming that as well. So if there is someone that you want to stand in for for healing, you know, we've had that happen many times. There are people that have come that are standing in for somebody else who couldn't actually get here. And they can stream in and see that person standing in them for them for prayer. So I encourage you to do that. But Thursday night, 7 o'clock, healing service. And then secondly, my family, my wife and I, we thank you so much. For the wonderful gift Sunday. Thank you so much. That was a, a blessing beyond what words can say. And uh, y'all are so awesome. Aside from that, the offering, just the year, the way y'all have poured into our family, spoken so many encouraging things to our family, been so supportive to us. It's been an awesome year beyond what I could think or imagine. I promise you that. <laughs> but I just wanted to tell you from our family how much we love you and appreciate you. And uh, praying for you as well. And I know so many of you are praying for us. And then last week, we kind of wrapped up a um, message, a series called Heaven's Invasion. And I called it Mission Complete. And the reason why I said it was Mission Complete is because Jesus did what he was supposed to do. Amen. And he said on the cross, what did he say? It is finished. It's finished. And it was more than just him dying. It's the whole package, everything that he did. Uh, he provided salvation from sin, sin uh, atonement from sin. He reconciled us back to God. He, we were able to make peace with our creator. Uh, death was defeated. The grave was defeated. Hell was defeated. Jesus has the keys, he has the power and authority, and then he turns around and says, all power and authority I give to you. <laughs> that is a part of the finished product. You are. You're a part of the finished product. And then we, we looked at what, what is the problem? What keeps us from being who we're supposed to be in Christ many times? And we talked about resistance. And I broke it down to three, three groups. There's passive resistance. Resistance, it's just from within ourselves. It's our flesh, um, 
Many of you have got New Year resolutions. You may have already begun your exercise program. <laughs> and what happens? Resistance. We have an uh, um, elliptical machine. We have the, the um, treadmill. We have a little weightlifting deal. We have one of those stomach cruncher deals. And they get more dust than they get use. Why? Because of resistance. And resistance affects everything in our lives. It, it affects uh, arts, creative arts, as a writer, as a singer, as a, a person who paints, a person who, who, who uh, writes novels or writes stories, whatever it is in creative arts. You always are fighting resistance. Resistance keeps you from sitting down and doing what you're supposed to do. But business, entrepreneurship, businessmen, businesswomen, you, you, you face resistance with ideas and resistance in having the courage to follow through with certain things that you, you think you should do. We struggle with resistance. Dieting, health changes, exercise, overcoming habits, addictions, educating yourself, ethical change, conduct change, bettering your marriage, bettering your family relationships, standing up for principles, standing against adversity, spiritual growth, spiritual maturity, every one of those areas, you battle resistance in your flesh. As you participate in a 21-day fast, you will be battling resistance in your flesh. You will become familiar with resistance if you're not already. Proverbs 14, 23, I told you, says, In all labor there is profit, but in mere talk, it only leads to poverty. You just got to do it. And then the second point was defiant resistance, which is a spiritual opposition. Daniel prayed. His answer was released the moment he prayed, but there was spiritual resistance that kept the messenger from bringing that message. It delayed for 21 days. There is spiritual opposition, but again, the, the, the enemy is defeated. Both passive resistance and, de, and uh, defiant resistance is only empowered by the power that you give it. You're the one that empowers them. And then there's strategic resistance, which we call that empowered by the Holy Spirit. That's where the Holy Spirit lives inside of us now, and He's given us the ability to say no to this, yes to that, to do what we're supposed to do. He's gifted us and strengthened us. We are baptized in the Holy Spirit. We're gifted by the Holy Spirit. And so the uh, uh, Holy Spirit empowers us to do what we never could do before. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So that's what we talked about last week. But now we're moving into a 21-day fast that we begin today. And the Lord really kind of put this title on me. I think it hit me somewhere around Friday night. Breaking spiritual rigor mortis. <laughs> I thought it just kind of popped in my brain. That's what we're doing. That's what we're after. We're trying to break spiritual rigor mortis. You see, everyone who has a pulse, that means you're alive, fights and deals with resistance. Everyone does. That is, everyone who is still kicking and screaming, you're fighting resistance. Rigor mortis, rigor, stiffness, mortis of death is one of the recognizable signs of death. It has this image of lifelessness because the limbs become stiff. They're not mobile anymore because of something that goes on there. You say, well, I'm not dead. I'm just in a rut. Well, you know what that is, right? A rut's just a grave with both ends kicked out. That's all it is. You've heard that, right? The good news is that if you're in a rut or if you're experiencing spiritual uh, rigor mortis, there is a way out. There's a way to break through. Matthew 26, 41 is the first verse we look at. It says, all of you must keep awake. Give strict attention, be cautious and active, and watch and pray that you may not come into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Right? We know that verse. I've probably quoted that verse more than most verses in the Bible. The spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. Sometimes I paraphrase and say, the spirit is willing and my flesh is even more so willing to not do what it's supposed to do sometimes. But Jesus made this comment. He's the one that said that. And he said that to his disciples who could not tarry for one hour in prayer. You know the story well. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus is praying. 
He's praying to his father about what he's about to have to do to go to the cross. And every time he would go to the disciples, what are they doing? They're cutting some Z's. And Jesus speaks this word to them. He says, you must keep awake. Give strict attention. Be cautious and active and watch and pray that you may not come into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Here's this moment, this, this defining moment in the history of mankind and what Jesus is about to do on the cross. And the disciples are found lifeless, <laughs> still, sleeping, when they should be praying, praying. I tell you, church, we must be awake. We must be vigilant, watching and praying that you may not, that we may not, that we may not do this thing of which we should not do, and that we may do the things which we are supposed to do. And I think a part of that in the praying and the praising, right in the middle of that is fasting. Praying and fasting and praise, this is a couple of things that it's not, real quick. First of all, it's not optional. See, a lot of people think fasting is an option. It's not an option. We're going to look at that in a minute. It's not. We were commanded to do so. And we're instructed on, as to how to do it. Jesus wasn't wasting his breath when he was telling the disciples, this is how you're supposed to fast. There's a reason for it. It's, it's not a tool that like when you go up on your computer program and you go up to tools and options down here and then it says advanced it's not for the advanced it's not something that Jesus said don't try this at home this is only for the professionals <laughs> everybody is supposed to be doing it it's not manipulation it's not an attempt to find special favor with God it's not what it's about it's not conjuring up God to do something for us that's witchcraft that's sorcery. That's not what this is. Praying and fasting and praising is, however, rewarded in secret with secret things. It's also, it brings a focus and it diminishes distractions. It reveals plans and purposes and direction of God. Unbelief is opposed and diminished while faith is encouraged and increased. Fasting is not an option. It's something you're supposed to do. If you go, just go on the, the internet and go to Bible Gateway, and it's got all the translations that you, that you could possibly want, and you can search out anything you want to. Go there and just search out fast or fasting and take you a little journey through Scripture and see all of the great men of God that fasted throughout Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, and what unfolds to them in that process of fasting. And why they did it, for various reasons that they did it. We begin with our first point. It's not if you fast, but when you fast. Okay? It's not if you fast, but when you fast. Matthew 6, 16 through 18 says, Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. For they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have the reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, we gotta get to, to, we're going to get to the how you do this in a minute. But, but my first point is the fact that you're supposed to. Okay, now he before you get to this passage, before you get to verse sixteen, Jesus has been going through several scriptures and telling the disciples how you're supposed to pray. And he says, when you pray, this is how you pray. Prayer is not an option. What does it say in scripture? Pray without ceasing. You're always supposed to be praying. Now there's a little bit of different wording here in Matthew six for fasting. What did it say? Whenever you fast because we don't fast without ceasing we fast seasonally we pray without ceasing but we have seasons in which we fast and there's a purpose for that 
The distinction is simple. You can't fast all the time. You're required to pray all the time without ceasing. And intermingled in prayer without ceasing, there should always be seasons of fasting. It's not optional. It's not for the advanced. It's whenever you fast, when you do this. Matthew 9, 14 through 15. Matthew 9, 14 through 15 says this. Then the disciples of John came to him asking, why do we, this is the disciples of John, okay? Why do we and the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Now, I'm sure in this moment when Jesus just said this to John the Baptist's disciples, there was probably this, but they're kind of looking at one another like, oh, yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know, they don't want to admit they don't know what in the world he was just talking about because he's talking about the cross. I'm not going to always be with them. But they, there's no rebuttal to this. But what did he say? He said, when I'm no longer with them, then they will fast. Fasting is something we're supposed to be doing. The first issue here isn't that the, uh, it, this isn't even from the Pharisees. I think that's what stuck out to me. This isn't even the Pharisees. This is John the Baptist's followers who, that's Jesus' forerunner. This group should be more closely knit with them than anybody. Their leader and their teacher, their mentor, baptized Jesus. Yet here's religion at its finest, rearing its head in a competitive spirit. Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? See, they don't even know what fasting is about. That's that's the total wrong approach to even take. According to what Jesus said, they shouldn't even be aware that they're fasting, whether they're fasting or not, because it's something that's supposed to be done in secret. They've got no clue. And then, pay close attention, folks, to what Jesus does after he silenced them. He gives a glimpse of the fact what we should do. When I am gone, they will. When I am gone, they will. We should be fasting. It should be a part of our life. You see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and uh, uh, John the Baptist men, they fasted uh, probably two days out of the week. That's what the thought is. They fasted probably two days out of every week. And so they're doing their two days out of every week, and they're, I guess, noticing that when they see the disciples, they're they're always eating. I don't know how they figured that out. But it makes them think, well, they're just not fasting like we are. But number two, my second point is, it's how you fast that determines how you cash in your fast. It's how you fast that determines how you cash in your fast. Because here's the Pharisees who fast for two days out of every week. And yet the Messiah is standing right in front of them and they can't recognize him. Their fast is not yielding much good for them. Fasting for 40 days, it doesn't help Muslims find peace in their religion, does it? No, it doesn't. It doesn't help them understand who God really is. Matter of fact, I think it it buries them deeper in their deception. So it's important not just that you fast, but it's important how you fast that determines what you yield from that fast. Matthew 6, 16 through 18, back to that same portion of Scripture that we were looking at. We first just looked at whenever you fast, you're supposed to be doing it. Then it says how you're supposed to do it. Do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. Don't fast like the hypocrites do. They neglect their appearance. They say what they will. Uh, So they'll be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have the reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret rewards you. Do not put on a gloomy face. 
Don't mope. <laughs> Don't try to appear like you're fasting. Don't complain about it. That's probably the hard part. <laughs> because see, what you're, really not, what you're really doing many times is not complaining. You're announcing. You're announcing I'm fasting. Wow, what was me? I mean, you... <sighs> Look at me, I'm fasting. Guess what? If we could make the sound of money, ching, ching, you just cashed in your fast. You just cashed in your fast. Uh, it's kind of like uh, you might be a redneck if. <laughs> you just cashed it in. Here's your sign. You just cashed it in. You're announcing your process to everyone, then you just cash in and receive your reward. Enjoy. Oh, the joys of pride of religion. Wash your face, look normal like you do every other day. Don't do anything to draw attention to yourself. Suffer the pains of hunger silently and keep your mind on Jesus and not yourself. That's how you fast. That's the proper way to fast. But you see, what happens is there's this desperation of self. Self is always trying to preserve itself. Always. That even when you're putting yourself through discipline of fasting, and the denial of food, flesh is still desperately trying to exalt itself instead of letting God do the exalting. Fast in secret. No doubt, we all know that we're corporately fasting. Gotcha. But that doesn't mean that we have to dwell on it, talk about it. I don't even need to know how you're doing it, what your conditions are. You don't need to know how I'm doing it. There's no pressure here. The purpose is how you fast. And that corporately we're coming together and we're pursuing the heart of God. And we're saying this is how we're going to start our year. And we're laying it down for you, God. We need to hear some things from you. We need some things to take place in our own heart. And we know there's some dying to flesh that needs to take place. And so that's what we're going to do. You know, if you've ever taken your kids to Chuck E. Cheese... You know, you give them $20, and they go and get all those tokens. So your $20 has just been converted to nothing. <laughs> you know, but at least it still kind of sounds like money, you know. And then they take those tokens, and they go to the machines. And if they're halfway successful, now your tokens have been converted to tickets, right? And the more they play, they get this pile of tickets, and then they take those tickets and they take it to this counter and they count up the tickets. And they look at the counter and this, this cheap plastic <laughs> useless toys that cost about 15 cents probably. <laughs> and it goes up in value as you look at the toys that go to the back of the little room there. And those are stuffed animals and it's this ridiculous number of tickets to purchase them and so your twenty dollars got converted to tokens to tickets to now about a dollar's worth of plastic that's going to get lost in the suburban or between the cushions of the couch and you'll never see it again when we fast we must make sure that we don't cheapen the process by doing it out of pride or for the appearance of being spiritual or in with God. Because the moment you do, ching ching, you just cast it in. <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> Nobody's going to own up to it. I'm not mad. I just see who I had to pay at the end of the service. Here. The moment you do that, you cashed it in. You took your fasting tickets and you walk out with nothing. Cheap and pride. False feelings. <laughs> 
first of all, the right way to fast or the wrong way to fast has absolutely nothing to do with are you going to fast and just drink water or are you going to fast and drink juices or broth or are you going to do a Daniel fast or, you know, you fasting from this or from that. That has absolutely nothing to do with how to properly fast. It is your heart. It's what Jesus was trying to tell them. When you fast, whenever you fast, this is how you do it. Because any of those other options that you choose, if you don't take care of the issue of the heart, you have wasted your time. You are no longer fasting. It's not a fast, it's a farce. Or a cruel diet. <laughs> but it's not a fast. The right way to fast is seeking and honoring God out of broken and humble heart. That's the way you fast. A fast is done in secret. It's not done on display. It doesn't matter that we're called to a corporate fast. It's still private to you. You keep it private. You, you, you put it on your, your best face and walk out the door and take care of business. It's like you would any other day. But what you realize when you walk out the door, my sustainer today is God. My strength today is is God. My wisdom today is God. He is everything. He is my supply. He is my all in all. I am denying myself of everything else that this world would try to give me to sustain me. He is my sustainer. He is my life. He is the way. That's what you're doing when you fast. Then number three, here is fasting's cash conversion table. <laughs> The possible rewards that you get in secret. In my extensive travels, which may, mainly is across the border to Matamoros, <laughs> you know, I've gone through those processes of exchange. One time I, I went, a, I, went a, I, was, I was actually building Sunday school rooms at a little church on the back side of Matamoros. And I saw things that they didn't have. And particularly, it was hot in there, and they had no circulation of air. I thought I'd go get them some ceiling fans. That was one of the things on the list. So I went, drove through Matamoros, back across the border, and I forget the name of that lumber store, but it was one of those old lumber stores. It wasn't even a Home Depot. But I pulled in there, and I bought what I needed. I had my receipt. I came back across the border. I got stopped. Now, these, these guys on the border, they knew what we were doing because we were constantly going across every day, every day, back and forth. And they pulled me over to the side, but they didn't take me over to the area where they go through your car. They pulled me over in this little parking lot area, and then this high-ranking officer came out that I'd never seen, and he began to talk to me. He made me get out. I walked. He, he took me uh, into the little building and went up to, like, a second floor, I'm sitting in a room, and I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, you know, what have I done? The guy at the table doesn't say anything. I don't know if he spoke English. He just kind of grunted at me, took my receipt on a calculator, turned the calculator around, and I'm figuring at this point, oh, he's making me pay taxes on the ceiling fans and the things that I'm carrying across the border. And I see the digits there, and I think, oh, my goodness, I don't have that much cash on me. And then I click, I go, uh, pesos or dollars? <laughs> yes, I can pay that. <laughs> he was showing me, in pesos, there's a conversion table for everything that we do. I found one time a, a bill, it was from a, a, an Asian country, and it, it had a one and a whole bunch of zeros behind it. And I thought, oh. Yes, this has got to be good. Look at all those zeros. And I go online and I find a conversion table and I had about $20. I think I still have that somewhere. But there is a conversion rate or a cash in or a return in everything that we do. Really, both good and both bad. 
Fasting has a return. There is a cash in. What you receive in that cash in will be determined by how you fast. We know the outcome of an improper fast. It's the pupping up of flesh. But the cash in value or outcome of a fast done properly yields some awesome things. And, and this is not exhaustive by any means, but here's a couple of them. I believe without a doubt, and I think the primary thing, I think the thing that I'm shooting for personally from a, a time of fasting is the main benefit of a proper fast is belief and faith. Belief and faith versus unbelief or lack of faith. Uh, Matthew 17, 14 through 21. This, again, is a very familiar passage. Matthew 17, 14 through 21. We've heard this many times. I've quoted this passage more times than I can count. When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and he is very ill. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him and the demon came out of him and the boy was cured. At once, I made that bold print on mine, the boy was cured at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible to you. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. The inability of the disciples wasn't that they weren't fasting, but that they lacked faith. That's what it's saying. Jesus said, because of the littleness of your faith. Fasting is not a trick, but it's a process of denying flesh, focusing on God for the purpose of growing in our faith, of stepping out into unwavering belief. Now, don't judge the disciples. I believe that's why Jesus included that perverse comment. Because Jesus wasn't just rebuking the disciples. He, was, he turned and said this to everybody, including the Father. He said it to everyone. Even the Father of the lunatic. This kingdom living stuff isn't about pointing fingers, isn't about accusations of each other's inadequacies or inabilities. It's about knowing God with greater clarity and deeper faith. That God is exactly who he says that he is. Belief that God is fully capable of doing what he says that he can do and that nothing is impossible. But here is the kicker. Here's the real issue. Matter of fact, we all amen to that point. We all amen to all those points. I amen them. But the fast is not designed to teach us that nothing's impossible to God. We all know that. The fast is designed to teach us that nothing is impossible to us. Did you see that? Nothing's impossible to us. See, I know nothing's impossible to God. But when I pray for the sick, I, I, I've been praying that a lot as I pray for the sick. I know that all power and authority has been given to me. But I need to grasp that there's nothing impossible to me because all power and authority has been given to me. And I believe that's why this was added to the end of that to say this kind does not go out except for much prayer and fasting because to get to that point of believing Nothing is impossible to you. It's going to require fasting and praying and praising. Radical steps. Because as you do those radical things, your faith is energized. And your faith is increased. 
so that you start realizing, yes, not only is everything impossible to God, but he's already commissioned me that nothing's impossible to me. That's why he said, go ye therefore into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son. And that all authority has been given to you. See, it's not just about telling them about Jesus. We believe that part. We believe what Jesus did on the cross and the salvation. But you need to understand, he's commissioned you to go. And that whatever you ask, you're supposed to get, right? Not vain things, not selfish things, but in his kingdom. Whatever we bind on, on earth shall be bound in heaven. Exactly, right? Are you with me? That's what the fast is for. It's to pull you out of your unbelief about what he is commissioned for you to do. It ain't just about Brother Greg. <laughs> See, that happens too much in ministry. Everybody has great ideas out there of what I should be doing. This ain't about me. This is about you. Number two, flesh is about appetite. Fasting is about denying it. Fasting is about appetite. Fasting is about denying it. Jesus returned from a 40-day fast and then proceeded to do miracles. In the course of his temptation in a 40-day fast, when he was tempted by Satan, what was the first thing he tempted him with? Bread. The, 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 the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and boastful pride of life. All three of those categories he dumped in front of him, trying to lure appetite. But 40 days of fasting had squelched appetite. That's what fasting does for us. It denies our flesh. It builds up your spiritual immune system. <laughs> The ability to say, no, get behind me, Satan. That's what Jesus was displaying for us by fasting. And if Jesus needed to proceed out there into the wilderness and fast, Jesus, Jesus, the Word made flesh, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us, fasting here on earth. Don't you think we ought to be doing that? Don't you think we probably could benefit from that? If Jesus benefited from that? Number three, out of fasting, you may find your assignment. See, some of you are trying to figure out what you're supposed to do in life. Through fasting, you may very well find that assignment. Look at the Apostle Paul. Now, he was evangelizing. He had ministry ideas. He was doing he had intentions of going and doing this and doing that. But out of a process of fasting, what happens to Paul? He gets a vision. He gets a direction to go preach the gospel to the Gentiles. Thank God that Paul fast. Because <laughs> the gospel was made available to us Gentiles. Out of the process of a fast. Fasting. Number three. Out of fasting, oh, I said that. You may find your assignment. Number four, <laughs> repentance is a product of a true fast. I gave you that sheet, uh, the handout, and it has uh, 21 days. And then in the beginning of that, it begins with reflection and takes you into a time of repentance, just, just laying things out before God. Fasting, true fasting, repentance is a product. Of true fasting. We love that passage in Joel. This is another commonly quoted passage in Joel so that we'll see the manifestation of the gifts and we'll see healings and we'll see dreams and we'll see visions and we'll see prophesying out of Joel. It says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. But look at the scriptures that precede that promise to Israel. Joel 2, 15 through 16. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Consecrate 
a fast. Proclaim a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and the nursing infants. Let the uh, bridegroom come out of his room and the bride out of her bridal chamber. This is the verses that precede the portion of Scripture that we love to quote about His Spirit being poured out on all flesh. Number five, fasting brings focus to your purpose. I, I used this old English proverb last week, but I'll just read you a couple versions of it. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Idle hands are the devil's tools. Idle brains are the devil's work houses. An idle brain is the devil's workshop. If the devil finds a man idle, he'll set him at work. If the devil finds work or mischief for idle hands, or the devil finds work or mischief for idle hands to do. These are all variations of the same English proverb varying from the 1700s into the 1800s. But here's the truth. Idleness means that you have no particular goal in mind. And thus, you are easily distracted. Idleness means you have no particular goal in mind. Doesn't mean you're not busy. Just means you're not busy about the right business. I had a, a, a young man, I've told you about him before, that I picked up out of, uh, he was, I went to high school with him. He had drug problems. I picked him up at 90 day, after he finished the 90-day drug program. And he came to my house. And he was busy about all kinds of things. Goofing off doing this and goofing off doing that. Doing all kinds of things except for the things that he was supposed to be doing. But fasting, see, brings a focus to our purpose. Brings a focus to our cause. It gets rid of idleness. It eliminates idleness. Fasting keeps your flesh focused on the goal. The battle of resistance that your body into, enters into reminds you with each waking moment that you have set time aside for the purpose of pursuing God. So when you feel hungry, just remind yourself, I've set, this is, this is a, it's like an alarm going off in my body. I'm pursuing God. Go get your Bible. Start reading your Bible. Pursue God. God will be honored both individually and God will be honored corporately by what we do together. This isn't about how successful you are at your fast either. It's the fact that you've purposed in your heart to pursue Him and honor Him. If you blow it, tomorrow is another day. Start it again. Stay at it. If the little voice tries to give you guilt, give it a thump and tell it to go away. It's not about that. Jesus made it clear what it's about. It's about your heart. So just pursue him and, and do it. And if you fail, brush it off. Pursue it again. It'll be a season of fasting for 21 days. But pursue him. And you'll get better at it. Some of you may have never even done it. So you might, might, might struggle with it. It's okay. Just do your best. Yield your heart to God. If you deny yourself of food and fail to pursue God, it, it's not a fast, it's a farce. Don't fast as the hypocrites. That's what it said in the scripture, right? Don't fast as the hypocrites. Let me reword that. I think this was influenced me a little bit from one of the writers that sent me some, some of their work from the, on fasting. But don't be a pretender. Don't fast as the pretenders do. Uh, don't fast as the actors do. See, that's what a hypocrite is. Pretender, actor. The hypocrites actually refrained from food. They were actually fasting in the sense that they were denying themselves of food, but they were cashing in their reward for a great performance. <laughs> that was their reward. They gained nothing internal from it. You're not changed from it. Then you find yourself spiritually dead. Rigor mortis. Stiff, dead, puffed up, proud, unusable for the kingdom. You see, man looks at the outward appearance. But what does God look at? He looks at the heart. It's about the heart. Fasting cleanses your body. I say this, water 
is your friend. Everybody say that. Water is your friend. Water will help expel the hunger pains and relieve the temptation for food. Water is your friend. And by the washing of the water, of the word, you'll find that's what's happening in the natural to your body. It's also going to be happening spiritually to your soul. Water is your friend. <laughs> Let him cleanse you by the washing of the water of his word. Here is the bottom line. Matthew 6, 33. We know this verse. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. I just say, Lord God, we are entering into a time of fasting as a church body. And we are seeking you and putting you first, Lord, over all things. Everything that we think is important, we're putting you first. We're seeking you, Lord. We're drawing near to you. And we know, Father, your word says that we draw near to you. You draw near to us. Lord, there is a, a heart, a, a desire within us, Father God, to see breakthrough in areas in our lives breakthrough in things that have been prophesied over each one of us individually. We've all had words spoken over us. There's been things spoken on us. There's been things birthed in our heart that we want to do. We want to see breakthrough in those things. Lord, there are things corporately as a church that have been prophesied on this church that we want to see come to pass. We want to see breakthrough. Breakthrough. And I pray, Father, that you'll use this season that we're stepping into, Father, to Break away that rigor mortis, <laughs> that stiffening, that walking year after year the same way that we walked the year before. The ruts to diminish and to go away. That we'd not be prematurely settled into a grave, but set free. Lord, that our, our belief, Father, would be increased. Lord, that you would move us in such a way through this process where we, we would come to a place where we realize that nothing's impossible to us because of you. We believe you, Lord. We believe your word. We ask you, Lord, to help us in our unbelief. Lord, that you would just take that away from us. And Father, your word says if we have the faith of size the grain of a mustard seed. We move things. We say to this mountain, be moved over there. And it is so. If we have just the faith of the grain of a mustard seed. So Father, we're asking you, Father, that we will begin our year, that you would bring us to that place, Lord God, in our own hearts, of knowing that if we have the faith of the grain of the mustard seed, nothing is impossible. To us. It's about your kingdom. It's about your will being done. And we know that. And we want to honor you and we want to pursue you. And Lord, I think of that scripture of Proverbs 29 1. It says, A man who hardens his neck after much reproof will suddenly be broken beyond remedy. I pray, Father, that you would break that spiritual rigor mortis, that stiffening of the neck, that stiffening of the heart out of us. That Lord, we not walk in pride or spiritual pride, but humility. You'd take us through a process in the weeks to come of reducing our flesh to the point of humility, causing our body to bow, to bow. I just thought of that this morning, deep calling unto deep. Lord, take us into deep places. Deep calling unto deep. Let us hear your voice, Lord God, calling us into deeper things. I pray, Father, there'll be, there'll be young people, Father, that, that 
didn't even know that they have gifts of words of knowledge and prophecy and different types of gifts coming forth out of them. It'll just begin to happen. Help us to begin to recognize that, Father, not just in this building, Lord God, but in our homes while we're at work. Give us words of knowledge. Let your spirit be poured out on all flesh, just like it says in Joel. But Lord, let it begin by us just denying our flesh and saying, here we are, God. Here we are. Come and do something beyond what we could think or ask, beyond what we could imagine, and take us into deeper things. In Jesus' name, I pray. Everybody stand. Amen. Are you ready? <laughs> we have a sign-up sheet in the back. If you want to come here and pray, you're welcome to do that. We're kind of scheduling having someone here on site, depending on how you sign up. So if we don't see a name in that block, then we won't be here. <laughs> to give you access. But if your name is in that block, we will. If there is an activity going on, like families on the go or church service, whatever's going on, healing service, and you can either come in here and pray for like during the healing service or like if they have live ladies Bible study on Tuesday, then we're gonna have a room over next door with praise music going on that you can go in there and pray. So if the doors are locked here, and we're on the premises, we'll have that available to you over there. But we're just going to keep praise flowing on the campus <laughs> and prayer flowing. And then you've got that sheet, 21 days of things to be praying for. And I'll probably give you some other things next week, just maybe some things through the hour of each day that you can focus in on. One would be our country. We'll be praying for our country. Uh, I don't know if you know it, but we're approaching the 40 year anniversary of Roe v. Wade. Did you know that? That's not a good feeling. To be approaching the generational 40 years of abortion. I'm praying against that. I'd ask you to join me in praying against that. We'd see that thing fall. Um, praying for our troops. Praying for Israel. Praying for all the stuff that's going on in the Middle East. Praying for our enemies. <laughs> Praying for our enemies. There's just all kinds of things that we can be focusing in on. So I'm just giving you some things to look at. And I'll give you some things next week so that we can come together as a body, really focusing on certain things as we fast. And then, of course, you have your own individual needs. I have some things individually in my own heart, personal things that I want to see take place. And I'm believing it. Believing it. Amen. Father, we just come to you right now. It's a little bit different day. I just wanted to make sure we walk through what's really important about fasting. It's not the, the way we do it in which the food or what we refrain from per se. It's, it's really the heart of how we approach it. They say we're not doing it for show. We're not doing it for our flesh. We're not doing it for the for our pride's sake, we're doing it, Father God, for one purpose and one alone, and that's to seek you, to seek first the kingdom of God. And Lord God, that you would be our primary focus for the next 21 days, Lord, in all that we do, from the moment that we lay our head down on that pillow, Father, even when we wake up through the night, immediately our mind will be drawn to what we're doing, and we'll be just be in continuous prayer. When we wake up in the morning, we'll immediately be focused in what we're doing, Father. We'll take these things that we're doing corporately together, just praying over these things, expecting and believing, Father, that you're going to increase our own personal belief. Our walk with you is going to go to a deeper place, that, that we can do the things that you've birthed into our heart, the things that you've called us to do. We can do those things. Nothing is impossible to us because of you. So we give you all the praise, and we give you all the glory. Father, I pray, Father, that this season will not be something that we have to dread. This season will be something that we are excited about, that we're, we rejoice through this process, 
Father, we don't have to worry about our face moping or dragging, Father God, but that we'll be, we'll be uh, energized with your presence and energized with your glory and excited about what you're speaking to us. I pray, Father, you open up, open up. Lord, as we talked about that open heaven, just open it up and let us experience the voice of God and the touch of God in a way that we have never done before in our life. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.